and obedience, because genuine faith always results in obedience, trust, and obey. That's the way you prove whether or not you have genuine faith, is whether or not it changes your life, whether you learn to obey what you claim that you believe. Please take your Bibles and turn over to Revelation chapter 3. We're looking at the church at Laodicea part 4, and tonight we start the section dealing with how to avoid becoming like Laodicea. We've seen all the bad things about Laodicea. We've seen all their wealth. We've seen all the ways in which they were carnal, how they were involved in Gnosticism, and all the things that a church ought to avoid. We've talked about how we are living in the Laodicean age of the church age. We're right near the end. We're right before the Lord returns, which is what the rest of the book of Revelation is going to be about. But there's Laodicea, and we're here. So the question is, how do we avoid becoming like, like Laodicea. I'm in Revelation chapter 3. I'll begin reading in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Gracious Father, again we pray for your blessings upon your word as it goes forth tonight that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Like the church at Philadelphia, the letter to Odyssey also mentions opening a closed door, but this time it's in the context of fellowship, not merely the context of outreach as we saw at Philadelphia. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That's fellowship. So how do we get back into fellowship with the Lord? How do we avoid becoming a church like the church at Laodicea? There's some incredible promises given to those that overcome, to him that overcometh. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne? That's pretty close to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that indicates a position of ruling, a position of power, a position of authority, a position of judicial inquiry and judgment. If you avoid becoming like Laodicea, or if you are like Laodicea and repent and open the door for fellowship to Christ, these are the promises that God gives to you. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne overcoming the sloth of Laodicea, overcoming the pride of Laodicea, overcoming the self-sufficiency of Laodicea, overcoming the have-it-all attitude of Laodicea, overcoming the blinding power of wealth of Laodicea. If you overcome, he says, you'll sit with me in my throne. You can hardly imagine a greater privilege than that. But what stands between us and receiving that promise? It's a promise to those who overcome. 
What is fascinating to me is the last phrase of that verse 21, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Jesus overcame the temptations to be like Laodicea. This is not one of the things where we say, well, Jesus never faced this kind of temptation, and uh, so he really doesn't understand me. Our Lord Jesus Christ overcame every form of temptation that the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons could throw at him, which means that he overcame every temptation that the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons can throw at you. Even as, that is, in the same manner as, I also overcame. Now, when God gives you a command to overcome, he will give you the empowerment to overcome. He's given you two primary sources. Number one, the word of God. As you study, you see how God deals with different situations. We talked about that in detail this morning. That's why you need to spend some time reading the Old Testament, because there you find people who fail to overcome. And you find a few stellar examples of those who did overcome and got incredible blessings when they did. And the second thing is God has given you his indwelling Holy Spirit, so there is nothing too hard for you to overcome. The indwelling Holy Spirit of God empowers you and enables you to overcome. In verse 22, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Said at the end of each of these letters, he that has an ear, let him hear. In other words, God is saying, Jesus himself is saying, are you paying attention? He has just given us, and this is the seventh and final church, he has just given us every problem that a church can face during this dispensation. He has showed us some churches that overcame. He has showed us some churches that failed to overcome. He has given us the praise to those that did overcome. He has given the solutions for those who have failed to overcome. And if we are listening, he says, you can overcome also. You can overcome even the fact that you are living in the Laodicean church age. You can overcome even if your church has fallen into a Laodicean mode of thinking and doing. You can overcome even if you yourself have fallen into that and need to repent. Because you see, when you fall into the Laodicean mode, it means you are no longer in fellowship with Christ. He says, whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. So we're talking about believers here, those whom he loves. But we're talking about people who have closed the door of their heart to having fellowship, true fellowship, with Christ. And he stands there patiently knocking, waiting for you to open the door. Will you hear him? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, now, we talked about what the church at Laodicea was like. It's very much like the modern, compromising, neo-evangelical, charismatic, praise and worship church service, churches that focus on social justice instead of on separation of the gospel of Christ. We discussed the three different layers that we see with every one of the seven churches, each church being a real church that existed at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation. Each type of church described in the seven layers can be found throughout church history in every country and at any given time. And thirdly, each church mentioned in Revelation also appears to parallel the progression of the church as a whole through church history. In other words, they ought to see it closely parallels what we see in the church and the world around us today. Christ's invitation is come back into fellowship. Those in fellowship are hot for Christ. Fellowship is one of the key requirements of the Christian life. That's where we start tonight. Without it, a church will grow lukewarm. We are to exhort one another to love and to good works. When we have fellowship with other believers, it's more than we said last week than cookies and red Kool-Aid. Fellowship with Christ is a lifestyle. 
And so constant spiritual growth is what is essential to avoid becoming like Laodicea. You can't grow and then sit back for a while and let the daisies uh, grow up under your feet and then you say, well, I think I'll grow a little bit more and then you grow for a while and you say, well, I, you know, that was a little bit exertion of energy. I think I'll sit back and relax for a while. You will become like Laodicea. The Word of God requires constant, consistent, daily spiritual growth. It's like the old saying, when you stop growing, you're dead. And the same is true with the spiritual life. When you stop growing spiritually, you're dead. That was the church at Laodicea. So what are the keys to spiritual growth? Thus, what are the keys to preventing becoming like Laodicea, the medicine that we need to keep from becoming spiritually dead? Fellowship with Christ, of course, is the first key to spiritual growth. Laodicea had lost it. They were saved, but they were totally carnal. So how do we go about growing spiritually our entire lives without growing stagnant? Well, we love it when we see a, a kid come to Christ in summer Bible school, and then we encourage them to grow, and, and they're eager there at first. And you've met Christians like that. They're always eager to tell you what they just discovered in the Bible. And you, you yawn, and you say, oh, I knew that a long time ago. Instead of encouraging them, saying, wow, you saw that yourself? Yeah, yeah, you didn't use a study book? No, no, I was, I was reading it. And look at what it says. We need to encourage that kind of spiritual growth because as we grow up spiritually, we tend to think, I know it all. And when we do that, we're like Laodicea. I have need of nothing. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's just float along. There has to be constant spiritual growth. So how do we go about growing spiritually our entire lives without getting stagnant? Many people have been Christians a long time, but they have seemed to stop growing spiritually or perhaps never really grew very much at all. We can outline spiritual growth through a series of steps. Now, some of this you will say, oh, that's old hat. I know that already. We're going to start at the beginning. Where do you start with spiritual growth? Well, you don't have growth until you have life. And a believer's new life begins at the moment of salvation, or what is called spiritual birth in John chapter 3. Ye must be born again, or you must be born unothen, from above. You cannot grow spiritually unless you have been born again. Now, I trust that everybody here in this place has been born again. If not... It's simple. The gospel, the good news is, Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And the response that you're supposed to have is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The good news is not what you do. The good news is what Christ has done. But the response to the good news is you must believe. And the moment you trust in Christ, you are brought from death into life, and you can begin with your spiritual growth. You know the basics. New life is received by faith in Christ as personal Savior. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's the beginning. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 and, uh, through 10. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I suspect every one of you can quote Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. But you know, folks, this is where we have to begin. Never forget that. When you're talking to somebody... Make sure that they have started at the new birth. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The believer has to receive the new birth. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, that is, but of the will of God. John 3, verses 3 through 7. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, that's physical birth, and of the spirit, that's spiritual birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That parallels man being born of water. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That parallels being born of the spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And that's a play on words in Greek. Born again or born from above. Anothen. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that, being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Peter talks of it as well. Being born again, 1 Peter 1.23, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. That's the basics. You say, well, I know that. But it doesn't stop there. I hope you've gone farther than that. The believer must be born again. The believer receives Christ. He receives a new birth. It is a gift from God. It is a gift of God's grace. It is wrought by the Spirit of God. But then we have spiritual growth. That's what comes next. And Laodicea had fallen out of the pattern of daily spiritual growth. And as a result, their hearts had grown cold toward Christ. Did you know that Spiritual growth is required by God. It's not just suggested as the best plan for your life. Spiritual growth is required. Spiritual growth is not an option for an obedient Christian. Spiritual growth is commanded by God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, all the promises that have gone before this in the first six chapters, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You have a responsibility of perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I wonder, how often do you think about holiness. I mean, focus on it during the day, every day. It says that we're supposed to be perfecting it. For example, when someone is a pianist, they want to perfect their performance of the music. Did you know it's not merely the mechanical aspects of hitting the right keys? because you can hit the right keys very, very slowly, one at a time, but you're not making music. It's not merely a matter of hitting the right keys at the right tempo. You're making mechanical music. It's not merely hitting the right keys at the right tempo, but you also we're going to look at the crescendos and the diminuendos and the retardandos. You're going to look at all the dynamic markings and all of the emotive markings that put the soul into the piece of music. You're going to learn it by heart. When you go out to perform, hopefully you will not have to have the sheet of music in front of you, but you will be able to perform it from memory. And it will move your audience to be drawn into the music. When you perfect holiness, it's like perfecting the music. 
so that as you live your life before others, and as they see the holiness of Christ reflected through you, with the crescendos and the diminuendos and the retardandos, and the andantes and the allegros and all the different markings that are in the music, as they feel your soul being put into that, they are drawn to Christ, the one who gave you the beauty in your life, your perfecting holiness in the fear of God. How about Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15? Again, we find spiritual growth commanded by God, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Ah, so it's not just a matter of living a holy life. You're supposed to perfect holiness in the fear of God. You're supposed to be speaking it. And you're supposed to be speaking it in a very special manner, speaking the truth in love. That's kind of exciting. We can all speak the truth in a biting, sarcastic, critical, cynical, ugly manner. But it says speaking the truth in love. And you know what Paul says will be the result of that? You'll grow up into him in all things. If you're failing to speak the truth in love to those around you, you are not growing spiritually. We want it to all be internal where we don't have to interact with anybody else, but part of the spiritual growth process is interacting with other people, communicating the truth to them in love. And you grow up in him in all things, which is the head. That is, you as part of the body begin to function like part of the body is supposed to. Verse 16. From whom, that is in Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Ah. Your spiritual growth makes an impact on the lives of others in the body of Christ. You know what that implies? That implies if you're part of a church and you're not growing spiritually, you are hindering the body of Christ. When one member rejoices, the whole body rejoices. When one member suffers, the whole body suffers. I know this. You saw how slowly I had to walk to the balcony tonight to turn on the internet. I have one tiny tendon that really hurts. And you know something? It slows down this entire body. When one member of the body is not functioning the way that they're supposed to be functioning, you're slowing down the body. You're slowing down your own spiritual growth. That's the preceding verse but you're also slowing down the spiritual growth of the body of which you are a member. Colossians chapter 1, speaking of Christ, it says, Who we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's a responsibility that we have toward one another to help the body grow. Proclamation, warning, and teaching. Three things are listed in verse 28. And he says it's to be done in all wisdom. You proclaim Christ. You warn people of what will happen if they don't listen. And then you teach them in all wisdom. And you have a goal. Because the body is functioning together. Remember, that which every joint supplies, that makes the body grow. And he says you do it in all wisdom for the specific purpose that we may present every man perfect. That's teleos, that is mature, that is you've grown up. Every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor. So he gave a general we in verse 28. All of us are supposed to be doing this. 
And he says, I do the same thing, wherein I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. In other words, I'm not doing it on my own. I'm not doing it in the power of the flesh. You can only do this. You can only have spiritual growth in the power of the Spirit. If you're trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can't do this. You have to be walking in the Spirit. And part of what you do is you proclaim, you warn, you teach everybody else in all wisdom because your goal is to prevent, bring every man to spiritual maturity, prevent, present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Paul says that was what he did all the time. That's what he exhorts the church at Colossae to be doing. Spiritual growth is commanded by God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. You don't just do it one day. You don't just do it once. You don't just do it periodically. He says, you received this from us. We told you how you ought to walk. Now, I've done a whole series on walking in the flesh versus walking in the spirit, walking by faith, all the walkings of scripture. We did a whole series on that, so we won't repeat the series. But you're supposed to be walking. That implies forward movement. That implies you are exercised, and that implies you're growing stronger. We beseech you, brethren. We beg you. We exhort you. That is, we're giving you a command by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, ah, I love the next four verses, and to please God. The church at Laodicea was not pleasing God. Jesus weeps over the church at Laodicea. Jesus stands outside and knocks. Please, God. He says, I want you to do it. I want you to abound in it more and more. Paul was dealing with some believers in Jerusalem who had fallen into the Laodicean pattern. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 5. Beginning in verse 12, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. I hope you get that. That means you can have grown spiritually until you reached a point of maturity, and then because you stopped growing, you began to atrophy back to where you needed to be taught again. You thought you already knew it all, but you're all the way back down here to baby level again, and you need to have somebody give you milk. You need the easy things of the word. And you thought you were way up here because at one time you were. And perhaps Laodicea was at one time, all the way up there. But they'd begin to focus on the things of earth. They'd begun to atrophy. They'd begun to wobble back down to where they had need of milk and not of strong meat. For strong meat belongs to those who are mature. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even to those, now listen to the next phrase, who by reason of use, if you don't use it, you lose it. Any athlete knows that. Use it or lose it. I used to be an athlete. Three or four years ago, I stopped exercising. I just had too much to do around here. I used to first, when I first came here, I ran five miles every day. Then it got to where I was getting a little old and freaky for that, so I began to walk five miles every day. And I did that faithfully, consistently for years. I felt great. Several years ago, I stopped doing that, and I would go out and walk periodically. And you know what? Now it's getting to where I can hardly walk at all. Use it or lose it. The physical body gives you an illustration of what it's like in the spiritual life, except in the spiritual life, it's not the ultimate end because you can keep growing until the moment you drop dead and enter glory. 
those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Some have gone back to drinking milk instead of eating the strong meat. God exhorts us that we must grow spiritually every day. So how is it accomplished? Spiritual growth is accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to him and follow his directions. And we're going to look at how we do that and how the Holy Spirit gives directions. But let's just look at some of the passages that give us the general overview first. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Looking in a glass, you say, what in the world is that? You pull a cup out of the cupboard and you look in the bottom? No, that's not what he's talking about. It. He's talking about a mirror, a looking glass. What is it that reflects Christ to us perfectly? It's the written word that reflects the living word. And as we look into that and conform to it, we are changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord to reflect the image of Jesus Christ. The more time you spend studying the Word of God, the more you benefit from it. The less time you spend, you think, well, I've already read that passage. Well, I know that passage. Uh, you know, I, I can skip that passage. I, I think I'll just look at this one over here. And uh, it says, uh, hmm, well, let's see. They built also high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake not. Well, I guess I know that. Why am I supposed to burn babies to Baal? Devotion's finished for today. As you begin to look into the scripture, it begins to reveal areas that you need to clean the mirror off so you can reflect Jesus better. He's the one that we want to reflect. Second Peter 3.17 Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, Beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. It's possible to fall away. Peter's writing to believers. He calls them his beloved. He tells them they'd learned this stuff before. But he warns them, it's easy to be led away with the error of the wicked. That had happened at Laodicea. It is easy to fall from your own steadfastness. And so he exhorts us to continue growth. Grow in grace. How can you grow in grace? Grace is all there is, right? We receive grace at the moment of salvation, so that's it, we got grace. No, you need grace for every day. You need grace to walk through the day. You need grace to face the trials of the day. You need God's grace, and you need to grow in grace. How do you do that? By growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How do you do that? By reading the Word of God. By studying the Word of God. More importantly, by meditating on the Word of God. By memorizing the Word of God. By inculcating the Word of God in a practical way, saying, Lord, how does this apply to the tr trials, to the tests, to the, to the opportunities that I'm going to face today? Show me verses that I will be able to apply to life today. And you become like the vine in John 15. Branches that don't bear fruit, he clips them off. Branches that bear fruit, oh, those are what he wants. That's what he wants you and me to do. Every day of our lives, as long as we live here on earth, we are to be fruit-bearing because we are growing. We are a growing plant that produces fruit to the glory of Christ. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's fruit-bearing, Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Here's the fruit that you will bear if you are daily growing. As soon as you stop growing daily, 
you're going to be missing some of these fruit until all of them are absent. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Now, are you missing any of those in your life? Those are the first three principal fruit. Are you missing God's kind of love in your life? Do you have a greater focus on self-love than on love for God? Laodicea had a greater focus on self-love. But Jesus loved them, whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Joy. Laodicea thought they were happy. They had everything. But Jesus said, you're blind and poor and miserable. You're not happy. You're miserable because you're focused on temporal things. Peace. Do they have peace? No. They were worried about their stuff. Always worried about what was going to happen to their stuff. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If you're growing spiritually, there will be a manifestation day by day of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. It will be visible to others, and it will increase as time goes by if you are growing spiritually. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. All the things that you love, that your flesh loves, you know what you're supposed to do with it? They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. You know, we, we do that every now and then. We take a little part of the flesh and we nail it up and say, isn't that great? We nailed that part of the flesh over here and the rest of the flesh is busy running around all over here doing all these other things. Or maybe we nail it all up and it screams and yells and screams and yells. We can't stand the screaming and yelling, so we take it down off the cross. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And then Paul makes the command, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Remember, we're talking about walking. Ephesians chapter 3. Another point where we see this is accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to him and follow his directions. Ephesians 3.16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Boy, that's where your roots need to go down. Your roots oughtn't be going down in the middle of the world. Your roots ought not be going down in society. Your roots ought not, not to be going down in your bank account or whatever it is you own. You ought to be rooted and grounded in love as Christ dwells in your heart by faith. And then what's going to happen? Suddenly your eyes are going to be opened. Look at verse 18. You may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. In other words, all the dimensions. And to know the love of Christ. Here we are, back to loving Christ. Laodicea had lost their love for Christ. He still loved them. He never loses his love for his elect. But they had lost their love for Christ. He says, Paul says here in Ephesians, if you follow these principles, you will know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You'll be stretched to the maximum, fulfilling the full potential that God has given for your life. I think that's what we all want. That's where you're happiest. That's where you're most useful. That's where you're most beneficial to other believers in the body of Christ. That's where you're most potent in your outreach and testimony to the world that's living around you. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. You say... Well, Lord, I really want to walk by faith. I really want to walk in you. And please help me to take this really big step. And it's this tiny little one-inch step. Help me take another really big step. This little tiny one-inch step. It's beyond our comprehension what he can make you do. It says, 
exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. What's the biggest thing you can think that God might do with your life? And you say, oh, I think maybe over here. And you, oh, oh, wobble, wobble, I got it. And God says, no, over here. Above and beyond all that we could ask or think. And they say, wow, how am I ever going to do that? Well, read the rest of the verse. According to the power that worketh in us. That's the Spirit of God. God can take anybody and use him with power. Use her with power. He always does it according to his word. He doesn't violate the principles of his word. But he can do it with you. He wants to do it with you. Laodiceans, do you not understand? Jesus is knocking at the door. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to help you become who he designed you to be. That's available for us. Paul is giving us here what we need to do, what we need to follow, how we need to yield to the Spirit of God. And ultimately, verse 21 will occur, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. It's not you working it up in yourself. It's God doing it. Philippians 2.13 For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You say, well, I know a lot of that stuff. Okay. Are you living it? If you know it in your head, but it's not coming out in your life, it's worthless theology. It is only as the Word of God transforms your life, and the Word of God will only transform your life as you spend time in the Word, meditating on it, memorizing it, praying for God to show you how to apply it in your life, and you'll begin to grow, and you'll be back in fellowship, and suddenly the joy of the fellowship will overwhelm you and say, why did I ever leave this fellowship for the trash of earth that lured me away so quickly and so easily. The Holy Spirit uses specific means of growth. The Holy Spirit uses specific means of growth. This is our third major point. Obviously, continual reading of the Bible and continual obedience to it. That's the result of illumination. You won't know how to obey the Bible unless the Spirit of God shows you how to obey it. When you read a passage of Scripture, illumination means that you begin to understand it. But you won't understand it unless you study it. You won't understand it unless you read it. You won't understand it unless you pray over it. You won't understand it unless you say, Lord, I'm sitting at your feet right now. Show me what you want me to learn from this. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart unto understanding. Yea, if thou, listen, criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. It looks to me, that's Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It looks to me that if you really want to understand the word of God, it's going to take some earnest desire on your part. It's going to take some earnest striving on your part. It's going to take an intense amount of prayer and bequest on your part. Because it says, Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. I've been reading a chapter of Proverbs every day for more than 50 years. And I'm still seeing new things as I read through Proverbs. Dear people, the Word of God is infinite. It is so deep you can never get to the bottom. And most of us sit on the seashore and giggle when a few little waves tickle our toes. 
And God says, plumb the depths and find the pearls. Find the treasures that are there in the depths of the ocean. And they can be yours, and I'll show you if you will but swim. If you will but dive. If you will but exercise to learn to hold your lungs to go down deeper and deeper and deeper. What are you doing with the word of God? The Holy Spirit uses specific means of growth, which include continual reading of the Bible and continual obedience to it, which is where you need illumination, because it is illumination that shows you the application that the Holy Spirit means to apply to your life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he answered them and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You can't live just eating food. If you're a believer, the only way you're going to live, the only way you're going to grow is not by general reading of, oh yeah, I got the general idea of the passage. It says, by every word. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, not a jot or tittle shall pass from the law till the law be fulfilled. Jesus says in Matthew 4, one chapter earlier, the only way that you can live spiritually is word by word by word by word every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How many words are in the Bible? In English. Uh, King James. 1611. Okay, so how many words in Hebrew? How many Aramaic words are there? Do you know which chapters in the Bible are in Aramaic? Did you know that there are some Aramaic words in Jeremiah? Do you know what they are? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How many of these words proceeded out of the mouth of God? Answer, all of them. If you want a strong, healthy, growing spirit, how you live, how you grow, you grow physically when you take in food, how you grow spiritually, if you want a balanced diet, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I can't believe our time is up already. The Holy Spirit uses some other means of spiritual growth. If you want to avoid becoming like the church at Laodicea, this is a critical issue. I want to not be like the church at Laodicea. I don't want to end up with Jesus outside knocking on the door. I know he loves me, but I know he'll also chasten me because he loves me. I want to be in fellowship with him. I want to maximize the potential that he's built into my life. I want to realize that when uh, I'm, I'm thinking about taking spiritual steps of spiritual growth, I'm not thinking in terms of these little one-inch increments. Above and beyond all that you can ask or think, out here, and even out there, is not as far as he can go. That's how to avoid becoming like Laodicea. As you yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, as he guides you through his word, which he has promised to do, as he shows to you things that you should avoid, shows you things that you ought to be doing, empowers you to do them, gives you opportunity to do them, and you say, yes, sir. And by faith, you walk forward. One step at a time. And you know what will happen? You begin to grow. And you'll never become like Laodicea. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power. Oh, Father, we do not want to be like Laodicea. We've already seen what they're like. We already saw the riches they had and 
all the cool stuff that they'd managed to gather together. And they really trusted Christ because he told them he loves them. He told them he stand outside the door and knocking that he wanted to have fellowship with them. But they were dull of hearing. They'd focused on things of earth. They, like Ephesus, had forgotten their first love. Father, help us to learn what it means to grow spiritually, to be alive, to be either hot or cold and not lukewarm. Help us to be those who don't think we know it all, who don't think we've already got everything in place, but who understand that the Word of God is infinitely deep. And even the things we think we know, we don't even scratch the surface. There is so much more because it is eternal and it is infinite because it is your word and you are the infinite God who has given to us an infinite word. Thank you again, Father, for your word as we've seen it tonight. I pray that everyone listening to either this service here or over the internet or later at a, a broadcast off the website or perhaps someday on a, a CD or by other means, if they haven't taken the first step, that they will trust in Christ alone to be saved. They cannot grow spiritually until they begin at the beginning.